Awesome. So we're live. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Carmen Mombriquet, and I am here from the Faculty of Education and specifically graduate programs in education. And being an educator, I find it very difficult that I'm going to stay right here and you folks are sitting way over there. But, and, and ordinarily, if we were not connected to a whole bunch of things, and for the folks who are at home right now and watching this as it's being live streamed around the province of Alberta, and we have a number of folks who are watching, welcome to the University of Lethbridge. I hope you're enjoying your cup of coffee, that you're still comfy in your PJs and uh, life is good. The people who are here with us, they're all appropriately dressed, <laughs> and nobody has any coffee with them, which is really, by, well, one of our professors has a coffee, so I guess he knows what's going on. So both for the, the viewers at home, welcome, and the viewers who are joining us live, welcome. Um, over the course of about the next hour, what we want to be able to do is to acquaint you with Master of Education programming at the University of Lethbridge within the Faculty of Education, and the fact is that we have been doing this for over 30 years. Um, the U of L in many ways and on so many fronts in programming in arts and science, but the one that we're going to talk about specifically today is in education, has been pioneering some innovative ways in order to get wonderful educators across the province of Alberta to grow in their own professionalism and their sense of where they want to grow. And because of that, we've really differentiated the programming that we offer within our faculty. It's not a one-size-fits-all. For many years within the world of academia, we kind of would have the perception of, well, we know a whole bunch and this is what we think people need to know. And that changed rapidly within this faculty of education to, hmm, we're really curious about what our students want to know. I wonder if we can journey along with them and help them to be able to grow in that knowledge and, and, and their own area of interest. And because of that, roughly 30 years ago, as we started to introduce Masters of Education programming, we started to take a look at what do people want to know about. And in the beginning, it might have looked like a very general program of, of Master of Education and what teachers would need to, well, a little bit innovative. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to introduce the three that we're going to talk about in a minute. But what I want to point out, we've just pointed out to a couple of folks who are here, because the section that's dealing with counseling psychology specifically, that's happening in an hour's time in the room next door. So that if you're here and you're only really interested in the counseling psychology, ah, you can wander out, you're not going to hurt my feelings. But do appear over in 10, 50 in a few minutes. What we're going to talk about, and we, is me, Carmen Mumbriquet with the World of Education Leadership. Secondly is an area that we call curriculum and assessment. And Dr. Amy Von Haking, who is sitting over here to my left, she will join us in a few minutes and, and she'll give the overview on what we mean by this program in curriculum and assessment. And shortly thereafter, Dr. Nancy Grieg will take a look at teaching learning in neuroscience. So by the time you leave here today and by the time you finish your cup of coffee and get ready to change from your PJs at home and to close, we're going to hopefully acquaint you to the three main uh, venues of, of master's programming right now. Having said all of that, we're seriously taking a look at, for this coming summer, a fourth M.Ed. general program. That one in literacy and language. So when you go online, you may want to take a look and see what's happening there. And as I say that, it's for 2018. It's not getting ready to start in 2017. That's why we didn't put it up here. So 2018, we're taking a serious look, but we'll see where that goes. Okay, so a few overview items. With the Educational Leadership Program, which I'm going to explain in more detail in a few minutes, what we're taking a look at is about 25 months of your time. The program starts in July and is going to end two years in about a month later on in July. The curriculum and assessment, we're taking a look at a, a three-year commitment if we follow the regular capstone route, which we'll explain later on. The teaching, or the learning teaching in neuroscience, same thing. It's a three-year. With the folks who are proceeding in the leadership world, we continue to teach courses in May and June, and in the other two programs, not. And there's some rationale, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through uh, this morning's or this afternoon's presentation. Because 
students drive learning at the University of Lethbridge. Whether you're at home or whether you're here with us today, pay attention to our webpage. If you're curious about what we're, we're thinking about based upon what students are telling us they want to learn about, look and see what's coming up down the pipe. We're constantly trying to evolve to make sure that we're offering to the teachers of Alberta that which they need to grow in their professionalism so courses change. Pay attention to what it's talking about. Many of the students that I end up getting that come into the, the world of education leadership will tell me, and I, I find this actually occurring more and more all the time, that we really, as teachers in the field or as practicing school leaders in the field, we want programs that can accommodate to our time. That, and as university, we recognize just how busy you are. We were all practicing teachers and school leaders. That's what we did for a good portion of our careers, and now we're, we're really fortunate in that we're university professors. But we haven't left the field that long or for that much, or left it entirely because we're back and forth in schools almost every semester of our academic lives here at the university. And because most of you are Southern Albertans, you know that we send out a plethora of students for Ed 2500, for PS1, for PS2, for PS3, and we're in constant contact with practicing teachers. And we know because of that constant contact, you want a learning methodology that really appeals to your time. However, we're also hearing from numerous students that have attempted some of these 100% online learning environments that just never work for them either. So what we struggle with as professors is how can we accommodate and build in a sense of blended learning? How can we get you together as groups and in cohorts and as fellow learners and at the same time being able to accommodate your need for flexibility during the year when you're with children? So what we've done is, and it's pretty much universal across our programs, is a scenario that's sort of addressed up here. Summers, July, three weeks in July. Sunny Lethbridge, the city in Canada that has more sunshine than any other place. You get to come to Lethbridge and spend three weeks doing a number of things, but some that I like to point out. One thing that you get to do is to work in cohort and learn with each other. We believe, and we have all of the stats and, and the research to back it up, that's a great learning modality. The second thing that you get to do is you immerse yourself in learning again. Surrounded by colleagues who are passionate about the same thing that you are. And that excitement that builds from that level of learning really takes hold in that three weeks in the summer. Do you work hard? Yeah, oh yeah. Do you learn lots? Yeah, you do. Do you build a sense of belonging? Absolutely. But then when the three weeks are up, you go back home. You go to your schools. You become immersed again in the life of your school. You become very busy. So we can see the second part, then we start offering online courses. Online course, and I'll show you some of the, the ways that work out in a minute. The intakes always happen with the three programs we're going to talk to you about today in the summer. The program starts in July. Sometimes we give you some pre-reading to do just to get you, you know, your, your mind, the mind juices working again on, on this level of learning. But the intake starts in July. The intakes are done in cohorts. There will be roughly 20 people who will start to work with Dr. Grieg in learning, teaching, and neuroscience. There will be 20 people that will start to work with Dr. Von Haking in curriculum and assessment, and there'll be roughly 20 people that'll start to work with me in educational leadership. That's typically the cohort size. Might every now and then range to 21 or 22, but rarely. And it will very rarely range down to 15, 16, but sometimes that happens too. But we try to center in on 20. Why? because it provides such a great learning environment for you and it provides some diversity of conversation. It gives us diversity of background. It gives us diversity of experience, but yet it brings us into a commonality of what is it that we're really passionate about and what we want to learn. That's where we find that cohort happens. And ultimately, your achievement is increased. 
You're never abandoned. You're never alone. That cohort way of learning gives you colleagues to bounce your ideas off of. When we're getting ready to write major papers, we put you in peer editing groups so that you can start to do that work to support one another so that your learning is not only achieved, it's also in many ways enhanced. We have course-based programs. Each program clearly aligned with the coursework from the field of study and this business of cutting edge research conducted by faculty. The work that Nancy is doing with her colleagues from our neuroscience department here at the University of Lethbridge is world renowned. So we take that work and, and a wonderful researcher named Dr. Gibb, what she is doing right now with understanding the brain and, the, and that young pe person's development, to blend it into that, that level of work of what does that actually mean now for us as teachers? Well, that's where Nancy's expertise comes in. That's where she researched. That's where Dr. Gibb researched. The work of, of Dr. Von Haking and what they're doing now with understanding this whole business of student evaluation. What's the blend of student assessment and curriculum? How do those two intermesh with each other? They're researching in that area and you get that right off the press, so to speak, inside of your classwork. The work that I'm doing and coming to understand the impact of standards of practice, which all principals now in the province of Alberta, soon as the minister authorizes this in November, going to have to meet. What do those standards of practice look like in practice? That's my research area. That's what we get inside of our classrooms. Degree requirements. The programs that we're offering today, they have coursework made up of 11 self-standing courses. Well, there's really 12, 13, or 14, but we're going to get that in a second. You're going to take 11 courses with a professor here at the University of Lethbridge, either in the summer face-to-face -face or online during the year. Then you're going to pick one version of finishing your program. The vast majority of all of our students follow this exit route. They take what we call a capstone. A capstone is, the easiest way to describe it, is your journey in. It's what you have discovered and what synthesis that you can possibly make of all of this learning coming from that 11 courses plus some internships and your own exploration into the area. What meaning can you make of it? What can you now say you know? You put that in a major paper, you do a public presentation, that's your capstone. It's worth one course and that makes this number 12. Or some of you may want to get into the world of doing some active research. You have a question that's burning in your soul about your area of study and you'd like to explore it a little bit more deeply. Then in that exploration you may take the project route which requires working very closely with the supervisor and there's some elements of public defense that doesn't happen but you explore a topic with your supervisor you write your research findings at the end, you present that. That's worth six credits or two courses and now your program becomes 13 courses. The final exit route that we have in most of our programs, not necessarily all of our programs, is a thesis exit. Now we're getting into the world of, I, I, I caught this, this business of academics has kind of hooked me. I'd like to go deeper into this. My professors are always talking about research and I now realize that unlike my undergraduate degree when I said research, I really went and did a literature review. I went and found out what other people know about this topic and I summarized it and I put it in the paper. Wonderful piece of academic work. And in the world of research we quite often call that the lit review. But now we want to go deeper and we want to find out on our own. And we want to maybe do some interviews or, or do some surveys or, or do various elements of research and start to explore that topic deeper and come to my own conclusions and findings based upon what I'm discovering. Now that's exciting stuff. And that really is what brought Amy and Nancy and I to university. We really want to explore in that way. And so do some of you. And the blessing is, we don't make this decision as we're coming into program. We make this decision about 
two-thirds of our way through the program. Once you've had a chance to get to know your professors, your professors get to know you, take a look at writing ability and styles, degree to which you can conceptualize, and then we start having that conversation. Okay, what do we want to do to leave the program? I was either fortunate or unfortunate, I don't know which, because it took many, many hours of my life, but I got to review a brand new M.Ed. program that is starting up at Concordia University in Edmonton. Lovely institution. They're bringing in a program that has a strong Catholic focus to it. For many years in my life, I was a, a Catholic educator and a Catholic school leader, and I thought, this is an interesting program. And then I went through the program, and I rendered some opinions on various aspects, and then they, got, and they presented a little table that showed price of program. And I'm a fiscal conservative kind of guy, and my heart almost stopped when I looked at what people are paying for master's programs around this province. I looked at a, on that chart, they had a couple of the American universities that are presenting master's programs in the province, and they were looking at $27,000 and $28,000 for an M.Ed. program. The one that Concordia was about to start was going to be for $21,000. And then I look at, and we continue to publicize that at the University of Lethbridge, the approximate cost of, to Canadian students for an M.Ed. program here at this university with cutting edge, leading cutting edge professors in the field. And I ask, why are we charging $10,000? But that's what we do. And it's all tied up in government regulation. We have so far beyond, that's what it actually costs this university to offer this program to 20 of you, but that's what it costs. So. That's what it costs. To have this in your own backyard, for those of you who are here today, and for those of you who are accessing this via the internet, that you have this available to you is still really quite amazing. But there's a few other program fees that are applied. There's some course tuition fees, but you're still looking in the neighborhood of about $11,500. And that is ridiculous. So, but anyway, that's what it is. Textbooks you buy. And one of the things that I've noticed with the professors at, uh, within my program, and I know talk in constant conversation with the professors in both of the other programs, we don't go looking for the three and four hundred dollar textbooks that we force students to buy. It just seems to be almost universally, they're a very reasonable price even connected to that as well. But anyway, okay, that's the overview. That's the generality. Now we're going to go into specifics. And only because I let off, I'm going to continue. I lead the Education Leadership Program. Blessing is, we also have Amy teaching in the Education Leadership Program. In addition to help to lead the Curriculum and Assessment Program, that's the degree of overlap that we start to have within programs. There is a document that is coming out, and they've been saying this for two years, but it is. The Minister assures us that at some point in November, three documents are going to be signed off as ministerial orders. Practicing teachers, you know, and you've probably heard from your school divisions already, there's a new teaching quality standard about to be authorized by the minister. There is also about to be authorized by the minister a new school leader standard. Contains nine items, seven of which we've been teaching about in our program actively for the past close to 11 years. Two of which, the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit requirement, as well as the requirement for lifelong learning, is about to be embedded into the program. The seven standards of school leadership become the backdrop to the theory that we present within the Education Leadership Master's Program. We want you, when we leave our program, that if you want to go on to become a formal or informal school leader, you're well apprised of what these actual school leadership standards mean and how you can embed them within your practice of being a highly effective school leader. We take that as a non-negotiable element of the program. That's where we want to bring you. That's what the, the, uh, the focus point that we're working from. The coursework also comes from the field of education leadership. There's a body of literature that's out there that we want you to become aware of because it helps you become highly proficient at the task of leading learning within your schools. That's where we want to lead you. That's the coursework that we use. We also blend into it this idea of an internship. Gone are the days where we want students to come to university and learn all about this theory, 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 theory. They write some papers, then they go back to the school and do the real work. 
So we've made the decision along the way, how can we blend those kind of two understandings? So through your program, you take part in what we call an internship. You're going to develop an inquiry question about something around leadership that you're really curious about, and you're going to put into play that into practice inside of your school based upon the theory that you're learning at university. And you reflect upon that practice and the impact it's having on you as an educational leader. And in the end, you also have a nice little body of work to demonstrate to superintendents and to hiring committees if you think you actually would like to go on into a formal school leadership position. If you're already in that formal school leadership position, it helps you to build your portfolio that provides the evidence to your superintendent that you're doing and, re and meeting these requirements as well. We start to blend that level of language together. And it's also a preparation for both formal and informal school and school division leadership positions. With a couple of the ladies I was chatting with just prior to the presentation starting, and goes back to this idea of thesis, very quickly within the province of Alberta, central office positions are changing. The MED has been the historical entry route into many central office positions. In the very near future, a doctoral degree is going to be the entry point into some central office positions. A thesis gets you into doctoral programs or can help you, it doesn't get you in, it helps you get in and the many start to blend. So what does it look like in practice? What it starts to look like is something like this. In summer one, you come to the UofL, three weeks on campus, face to face, working cohort. Fall, it's online. Spring, University of Lethbridge, because we have the best weather in the country, we know that. We can actually say January is spring at the University of Lethbridge. <laughs> So in the spring, and that's actually what this is called, you take a course online. Then in May and June, you take a course online. Then in summer of 2018, you come back on campus for three weeks, face-to-face, -face, two courses, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Fall, you go back online. Spring, you're online. May, June, you're online. Then we come back for our final semester. In our final semester, if you're going the capstone route, then you're here for about three days in July of, I guess that would be, July of 2019, and you would, along with your cohort members, present your capstones, your degree is done. If you chose to do a project, if you chose to do a thesis, you're going one year beyond that. Just roughly, just keep that in your mind. So then it would finish the third complete year if you're proficient in what you're doing. And with that, we have to change over mic, because Dr. Von Haking is going to talk about this program. Let's get the piece right here, clip somewhere. Okay. I guess that's what it means to literally be wired for sound. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dr. Amy Von Hiking, and I'm the co-leader of uh, the MED program in curriculum and assessment with Dr. David Slomp, who sends his greetings. He is also the University of Lethbridge Board of Governors teaching chair. So in that capacity, he's actually giving a public lecture right now uh, to students talking about what their grades say about them or may not say, uh, talking about the fairness and validity of grading practices in schools. Uh, and that's pretty indicative of the kinds of challenges that we take up in our program. I am privileged to work with a group of 10 professors in our faculty who developed this program because of a passion for the, the research that they do, the work that they do in, in all areas of curriculum, in language and literacy, in mathematics, in science, in critical inquiry, in arts-based education. So we bring a whole range of, of subject area uh, expertise to our work with graduate students and that has really I think been reflected in the, in the really creative uh, and, and critical work that our grad students ha, uh, have undertaken. So this is a program that develops leaders in curriculum theory and redesign. Uh, we're in, a, in an exciting time in Alberta schools, but we are not just uh, in Alberta, but certainly in Canada and globally. 
We have uh, students in our program from all over Alberta, but also from British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Northwest Territories, and I hope that we may have others visiting with us uh, and tuning in uh, by distance who come from other provinces as well. But certainly there is a move, I think, um, not just in Alberta, but certainly broadly speaking, to, un to do a better job personalizing learning for our students, ensuring that we're actually teaching for critical, collaborative, creative thinking, that we're moving towards competency-based programs that are interdisciplinary and that do a better job helping our students prepare uh, for, their, for their work and their life ahead. So in this program, we're really um, attending to curriculum theory, helping students who are going to be able to lead and assist with curriculum redesign that we're really developing leaders who understand what it means to assess competencies like critical thinking, collaboration, innovation, creativity, all of those uh, competencies that we see now embedded into student learning frameworks. And we want to make sure that these are leaders who can demonstrate how to use classroom assessments to improve student learning. Assessment is there to help us do a better job helping our students learn. So that is really at the heart of what we do and to ensure that they can use classroom assessments to improve uh, their own practice. So as Carmen mentioned, our program is a three-year program. It's designed for full-time educators. The assumption is that they're, they're teaching full-time uh, and that they're able to be here with us in July for two courses and then take one online course in the fall and spring semesters. So part-time program completed in three years. I have to say that it's, it's a program that challenges a lot of teachers. Um, I'd encourage you to go to the websites and watch the videos, the testimonials, the stories of all of the students in, in all of our programs. They're the best advocates and probably can speak to you in the most meaningful way about what they've learned and how it's impacted their practice. Um, but there's a terrific video by Sarah Jans, who is a recent graduate of our MED curriculum assessment, a terrific teacher in Medicine Hat, and she talks talks very powerfully about being uh, a committed teacher, knowing she was a good teacher, uh, but that the program really ha helped her understand why. And in part, partly because it really challenged her, uh, some of the assumptions that she'd made about the design of the learning in her classroom and how she was assessing students. So it is a course that really stresses critical engagement with past and present theories of curriculum and assessment. You know, when you think historically, curriculum has developed in really interesting ways. We've long had initiatives towards child-centered, inquiry-based, multidisciplinary, project-based learning. But the assessments that we've been subjected to as teachers and that we felt we've needed to subject our students to have been very different, have not authentically assessed the, the kind of learning that we know happens. Uh, so what we've really tried to do is help our students develop theories and models that bring curriculum and assessment together and much more authentically assess the kind of rich and deep learning that we know our students can do and are capable of. Uh, so certainly we also stress a critical engagement with a diverse range of theoretical orientations and methodologies of educational research. Um, we have all kinds of initiatives in, uh, as educators that we're sometimes subjected to. Many claim to be evidence-based or research-based practices. Educators more than ever need to be very critical readers of, of educational literature. So we have two research courses actually in this program that are really intended to help you become uh, an informed and critical reader of research claims and findings. We also provide significant opportunities to integrate local issues, students' own professional context into their learning. Uh, the students that come to us come, for, as I mentioned, from different jurisdictions. They come from, from early childhood settings uh, to high school settings. They come from alternative programs. Some teach uh, refugee students. They bring the challenges and questions of their own practice that really reflect challenges that they're facing in their classrooms to their learning. So we've had Students, for example, develop an integrated science and mathematics course for high school called Cymatics. Uh, we had one grad student uh, develop a theoretical framework and model for more authentic assessment for music education at the middle school level. Had a student develop a, a framework uh, to guide curriculum development and assessment for play-based uh, learning in her early childhood setting. We have lots that are um, connected to literacy, writing assessment, and writing uh, pedagogy. So certainly there's the opportunity to use what you you're learning in classes to inform your work and, and pursue the questions that are of specific interest to you and we certainly have the scholars that can that 
that can mentor you in that process. So again, there are three exit options. Um, some will exit with that capstone that synthesizes their coursework and the learning that we've done that they've done. Others have chosen uh, to develop projects that they can take out and implement in their classrooms and in their districts. So they're actually creating professional products and able to. Um, to discuss those and support those with a really strong research base. And we have um, probably about a quarter of students in every cohort that have chosen actually to exit with thesis. Uh, what they've come out with is a passion for their own questions and, and an interest in conducting their own research. Uh, hopefully we can even convince them that going on to the doctoral level and continuing their research journey is going to be of interest to them. Uh, but all three of those options are certainly open to students uh, in the curriculum and assessment program. I do want to encourage you, as I said again, to go to the websites and take a look at what is uh, the information that's online there. We also have a leadwithvision.weebly.com uh, website that gives specific information about our program. Uh, but and please make sure that you're uh, contacting us for further information if you're interested. For those of you here, there are brochures and uh, business cards and contact information, so please make sure that you pick those up. For those of you at home, don't hesitate to take a look at us on the U of L website and contact us for more information. Over to my colleague. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of two of my colleagues in the Faculty of Education, uh, Dr. Chris Matatal and our new faculty member, Dr. Jeffrey McCormick. All three of us are coordinating our MED program in teaching, learning, and neuroscience. Uh, we actually have had two prior cohorts. Well, actually, one is completed. The other one will be completing in this upcoming spring and the title of that uh, those cohorts were was inclusive education and neuroscience and we felt that this time in our in our newest conception of the program that we wanted to make things a little bit broader so we are also including the neuro uh, in, enhancing the neuroscience component of the program as well and speaking of neuroscience i should say that we also have fabulous colleagues from the Canadian Center for Behavioral Neuroscience. It is one of the largest and most prestigious neuroscience centers in the country and we are extremely fortunate that we not only have great scientists working there, they're great scientists that actually want to work with teachers and really have a goal of improving education. Uh, some of you who uh, teach in Alberta are probably going to be familiar with Dr. Brian Kolb. Um, I'm not calling him old, but he won't see this, will he? Uh, <laughs> uh, but he has been, he started, he and his co uh, colleague Dr. Wishaw started neuroscience um, at this university and in fact uh, built it up to the point where we had the very first neuroscience department and now we have this very large center and they have a little building, well actually it's quite a large building, all of their own. Um, and we have also been working with, again, you may be familiar with this, Dr. Robin Gibb, who is doing a lot of work with the family wellness and loves to talk to teachers. And probably there's very few teachers in Alberta that haven't had the privilege of seeing her uh, present um, because she is passionate about particularly the early years and making sure that uh, we build the best brains that we can. And then finally, Dr. Robert Sutherland, who worked with our cohorts, um, our very first cohort, and uh, was the person that really laid the groundwork for our neuroscience courses. Um, the, the format of our program is similar, well, not similar, it is exactly the same that Amy just described. Um, so uh, I won't talk necessarily about the uh, the structure of the program, but I will talk about the content. Uh, it is a unique program. It is the only program in Canada right now, and there are only several in the United States, that actually have neuroscience um, uh, programs embedded in faculties of education. 
Uh, so, and it allows you to study with professors from the Faculty of Education and the Neuroscience Department. Three of the 12 courses are taught by neuroscience, uh, neuroscientists. Next summer, the first course will be taught by uh, Dr. Robin Gibb. I will say for those of you who, like me, who was an English major back then, do not be terrified by the concept of studying brain science, because uh, it can be intimidating to some people. And as they keep telling me, there, it isn't necessary for our teachers to know all about the structures of the brains, those funny names that they have, and all of the, uh, where they're located. The important thing is we understand the implications of what the neuroscientists know about the brain and how to translate that into improving our schools in both the ways we teach and the way our students learn. So um, you needn't be English majors uh, <laughs> of the world. We don't need to be concerned about taking a neuroscience course. We will explore the basic principles of brain development. We need to understand the brain um, in order to know that how we can, as Robin would put it, build healthier brains and make sure that our instruction considers the way in which the brain develops over time and not only helps us understand the little ones, helps us understand why adolescents really look like grown-ups, but they're not. Um, and we learn about those type of things. Then we move in, most of the courses will all focus on how neuroscience and educational research, particularly that done in cognitive psychology, informs our educational practice. There um, is a huge move to try to use brain-based research into uh, schools. The, the hard part is going to be how do we do it in a very logical and evidence-based way. Uh, and then that takes us to the skills, tools, and knowledge that we need as teachers to enhance both our own practice and ways to work with the diversity of the students that we see in our inclusive classrooms. And then finally, I put that last because I think it is absolutely important, uh, critically important as a profession. Um, and probably, and it certainly goes beyond our profession. We know now that just about everything in the world seems to have brain on it. I mean, apparently there's some research showing that if you have a book and you put a picture of a brain on it, people will more, be more likely to buy it because everybody wants to learn about brains. But the fact is, the sad part is, is it kind of brings out the hucksters as well. Um, if you, there are, a lot, there are a lot of books out there, there are programs that quite frankly are not based on sound neuroscience research. In fact, some of them are just plain made up. And a lot of people are making money and uh, doing things that at best have no impact on teaching and learning, at worst actually take children backwards. So it really is important that what we do as teachers is make sure that we know what we're doing, how we can apply it, and in, even in the same way, things that we still don't know and what, where the field will have to go from here. So as Amy mentioned, the pamphlets are there on the table. The information on the website is there. So if you have uh, any questions about the program, we would be more than happy to answer them. We can come up as well, and then if they have specific questions, we can ask, and, and we can do a mic transfer for the people at home. Questions? Oh. <laughs> We're, we're, we're pretty darn good if nobody has a single question. Yes. I just have a question about when you said the numbers cap usually around 2022. Do you, do you turn people away? Do you end up turning people away? So repeat the question. Oh, to repeat the question, uh, our cohorts are usually limited from 20 to 22, and are we turning people away? You know the answer to that question. And the short answer is yes, um, uh, because we do get more qualified applicants than we can uh, handle in our cohorts. Um, I, I, can I, yeah, do you I, I just want to put an extension to that. So, it's a, so what does that mean to you? Okay, so each of the programs that you apply have similar application process as well. You need reference from people like former professors. That wouldn't have worked for me when I applied to go back to my ed many years ago because half my professors were dead by then. <laughs> so then we, we, we say, well, what does that really mean? 
So what we want to go out and find are references that can attest to our ability to be able to do graduate level work. That's what that means. Then the second part to all of that is your own letter that you write to introduce yourself basically to us. So if you're applying to curriculum assessment, you want to put in your letter language around, why, why are you passionate about that? Why now? Why do you want to dig deep into that curriculum theory and it's a connection to everything we're now knowing about student assessment? Put that in your letter. So in, in a roundable way, what I'm really saying is you sell yourself for the specialization that you think you'd like to explore. What you don't want to do is to put into an application and, and make it so generic to say, please accept me to whichever program has the fewest applicants. <laughs> that doesn't work. That doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. So what you really want to do is put into your application why you're passionate about that and why you would be a great addition to the cohort of learners that are going to come together to explore it together. Does that, does that kind of help? Yeah. But unfortunately, Nancy's answer was right off the top. We turn away some years, many applicants, other years, not as many, but, and it kills every one of us to do it because we want people in. But resources, money, fine, blah, 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 we have to turn people away, okay? Right, so the question uh, was whether or not you need to find a supervisor in other graduate programs, other master's programs, particularly if they're thesis uh, based, you typically have to find a supervisor who will create program for you. That's not the case here. So the MED programs are distinctive in the sense that they're course-based cohort programs. Uh, should you decide to pursue, uh, to pursue project or thesis, you'll have plenty of opportunities to locate a faculty member who is best positioned by their own research and passion to mentor you in that. Nancy, maybe you mentioned on the mic that if folks at home want to write in questions, we will respond to them. Oh, yes, people who are watching at home, if you have a question, you can write it down and we will answer it. Okay. Any other questions? No, uh, the question was, can you clarify the, intern, uh, the internship and whether this fine young gentleman was going to be a principal right off the bat? Uh, yes, I can clarify the, the internship and no, you will not be a principal right off the bat. The, uh, let me give you a few examples of a couple of internships that have happened in the last few years. Uh, terrific grade one teacher uh, who had aspirations, would, uh, wouldn't mind exploring this idea of formal leadership uh, at that school like so many other primary schools, this whole idea of developing a literacy-rich uh, program came into vogue. She took on the responsibility of working with the primary school PLC around language and literacy. So she took the lead and was able to explore exactly what does it mean getting everybody on board, developing a vision for where they wanted to go, the relationships that she had to build with her colleagues so that they didn't tear her apart in some of these committee meetings. What does a committee meeting actually look like? What are end products like? How can we hold people responsible for what they say that they're going to do? And then in the end, she wrote a reflection paper on what does that experience really mean to her in her development as a leader? That would be an example of, a, of, a, of an internship. Another internship we had with a high school teacher over here at Catholic Central Campus West. They wanted to move to a, a mechanism whereby rather than teaching biology, chemistry, and physics at the grade, lev grade 11 level as discrete subjects that never had any overlap between each other, he brought the biology, chemistry, and physics teacher together and started doing some, some group planning around, around um, labs that students could do and bring in some of the essential understandings from the three. And he led that project. And then at the end wrote a reflection upon what it was that he was doing and that was his internship. In other cases, if they're existing vice principals, maybe that we want to explore how do we ensure that teachers don't leave and what the ATA tell us within the first five years of, of teaching, what do we really need to do with beginning teachers to mentor them into the culture and climate of the school, but also into ways of being really great teachers, showing that they can demonstrate all the competencies in the TQS document. 
So uh, one vice principal took that on, and rather than working as a quote-unquote evaluator, really took on the task of working as a mentor, and the learning that that person had was really phenomenal. So those are some examples. Does that help you with the question? Thank you. Now, Nancy, do you still run an internship in the neuroscience, neuroscience yeah, program? Maybe, maybe that's a little bit of a different twist. Do you mind taking that one as well? Uh, the internship that we do is um, to facilitate more informal uh, types of leadership. Uh, we have a real diversity of, of teachers that are working in our program. Uh, and so many of them have taken on small projects with, within their schools. Others are working with specialist groups within their districts. For example, there's one working with an, in a group of teachers that are all focused on inclusive education. Uh, and then those people are going back and being lead teachers in their schools. So we have to craft those, I think, sometimes with a considerable creativity because everybody's situation is so different. Uh, we've got rural schools to to uh, big city schools and so we but we certainly managed to be able to find something that not only uh, fulfills the requirement of the internship but is a very useful and uh, a, a, a project that really enhances the person's ability to bring together all that they've learned Uh, the question is about the, does the internship need the employer's approval? <laughs> and maybe I'll give the short answer and then I'll let Carl. It's yes, and it can be complicated. <laughs> uh, yes, in that, um, in both programs, we send out letters to superintendents, give, ensuring that they understand that an internship is going to happen, and basically giving either Nancy or a designate or me or a designate the right of access into your school so that we can work very closely with you in coming to understand the connections between the practice of what you're doing with the theory of our, our particular specializations. And um, we've had now in excess of 250 students complete one and or two internships has never been an issue. And we always have students go back into their own placements, their own schools, their own place of work to do the internship. The American version is they take you out of your school, put you into a foreign context, and have you do an internship there. That's not going to work in southern Alberta for multiple reasons, so therefore we don't do it. Is that okay? Thank you. In the back. Uh, yes, the question was um, of an example of one of the students in our cohorts that have implemented neuroscience into the classrooms. Um, there's a number of examples. I'm thinking of, of in our first cohort, uh, the project for the um, culminating activity, the capstone. Um, in British Columbia, they were implementing a process of using mindfulness um, and meditation in classrooms. And she took an, uh, a stance where she was going to evaluate it, both within her classroom, and she had a couple of teacher colleagues working with her, and looking at ap actual measures of the effectiveness of the process that uh, the BC government had had set forward. And she got some very interesting data, most of which was very strongly supportive of the use of uh, these type of practices within the setting. Particularly, she was focusing on children who had emotional and behavioral disorders. So in many ways, it, it verified for her that the program that she had been using for a couple of years was, in fact, something that was having a powerful impact on her students. Anything else? Anything else we can answer for you today? And, what, uh, and, and for the folks at home, uh, please don't hesitate to contact Amy or Nancy or, or myself for uh, follow-up information or email. Our email address are attached to all of the documentation that came out. Email us questions, set up a telephone interview. For those of you who are here live with us, um, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. If you have very personal questions you want to, to ask about your own dynamics, then feel free to come and ask them. 
and we can go on from there. If you go and proceed to the application process, there is a very, very firm December 1st deadline for applications. All your references don't have to be in by then, but all the references have to be named and a process starts to happen whereby the university starts accessing that information from them. So keep that December 1st deadline in the back of your mind and unfortunately it relates back to a previous question that we asked. You know, it's kind of like, does everybody get in? Unfortunately, no, but if everything is on time, it certainly helps you <laughs> in, in moving forward with that. So don't hesitate to ask questions, don't hesitate to contact us, and we truly appreciate you being here today. So thank you very much.